Good evening, I'm Adrienne Broder, the Executive Director at Aspen Words, and welcome to the second event in our Winter Words author series. For those of you who are new to us tonight, we're a Colorado-based literary arts nonprofit and a program of the Aspen Institute. But before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Carolyn Torrey, who will go over some housekeeping items and thank the many people and partners who make Winter Words possible. Thanks, Adrian, and welcome all. We'll be using the chat feature to post links to additional reading and information throughout the event. And we're delighted to partner with our local indie bookstore, Explore Booksellers, for Winter Words this season. Books make the best holiday gifts, I'm sure you all agree, and we've provided a link in the chat to shop for copies of Curtis Sittenfeld's books. We've set aside the last few minutes of tonight's hour-long talk for audience questions. You can submit your questions anytime using the Q&A feature in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, and I'll pop back in at the end to help facilitate that. And now I want to recognize and thank the partners who have helped make this virtual season possible. Thank you to our season presenting sponsors, Beth and Josh Mondry and Helen and Wally Obermeyer, our media partner, the Aspen Times, our grantors at the City of Aspen and Les Dames d'Aspen. And new this year, a very special thanks to our lead corporate sponsor, Book of the Month Club. We've posted in the chat with more information on their monthly book subscription service. Thank you to the Aspen Words Advisory Board, to all of our members, and to everyone here tonight who purchased tickets or passes this season. Adrian, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. Before we start our program, I want to announce that in February, Aspen Words will host Robert Kolker, author of Lost Girls, and most recently, the number one New York Times bestseller, Hidden Valley Road, Inside the Mind of an American Family, which gives the account of one family with 12 children, six of whom were diagnosed with schizophrenia. The event will take place on Wednesday, February 10th, and Robert Kolker will be joined in conversation by Rebecca Skloot, author of The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Stay tuned also for news of our March Winter Words event, which will bring together a delicious panel of food writers discussing how local cuisine and culinary traditions shape our identity and strengthen our connections. Both of these events promise fascinating conversations, so I hope you'll be able to join us. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's outstanding speakers. First, Curtis Sittenfeld. If you've read even one page of Curtis Sittenfeld's fiction, you know her books are elaborately plotted, perfectly paced, and populated by deeply relatable characters. Curtis is the best-selling author of seven novels, Prep, The Man of My Dreams, American Wife, Sisterland, Eligible, and most recently, Rodham, which speculates the trajectory of Hillary Rodham Clinton's life had she decided not to marry Bill. Curtis books have been selected by the New York Times, Entertainment Weekly, Time and People for their 10 best books of the year list, has been, have been optioned for television and film and translated into 30 languages. Curtis will be joined in conversation by writer and activist, Charlotte Clymer. Charlotte is the former press secretary for rapid response for the LGBTQ civil rights organization, the Human Rights Campaign, and an outspoken activist on issues ranging from feminism, LGBTQ advocacy and veterans affairs. She is a transgender army veteran and has written extensively on topics ranging from gun culture to discrimination based on gender identity. Her articles have been published in Glamour, The Independent, NBC News, Vice, and The Huffington Post, and she has appeared as a guest commentator on NBC News Sunday morning. With that, I'll turn it over to Charlotte and Curtis to discuss Rodham, a tour de force that examines the cost of female ambition and the trade-offs and compromises women make when building lives in male-dominated realms. On behalf of the Aspen community, welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for welcoming us. Uh, I am so honored to be speaking to Aspen Words. 
Uh, I have been looking forward to this for months. We, we made the uh, details for this event, I think back in, gosh, I wanna say June or July. Uh, and so I'm, I'm so deeply thrilled to be here and especially with one of my favorite writers, uh, Curtis Sittenfeld. I, I came to Curtis writing through her first book, Prep, about seven or eight years ago. I walked into a corner store in my neighborhood that had a mini library near the door where you could you know, leave a book or take a book. And one of them was Prep and the cover caught me. And so I took it and it just blew me away. Uh, the, I, I guess if, if there's one way I could describe uh, Curtis writing, it would be authentic. There's just this authenticity that permeates every bit of it that's just so fascinating to me. Um, Curtis, I, I am so honored to join you here, of course. Uh, I'm wondering from the get-go, um, I, I looked up your book because I got curious about this. I looked up your book on Amazon to see what categories it would put it into. Uh, it, it has it in the top 30 in political fiction. Uh, it's also ranked in women's friendship fiction and women's domestic life fiction. It is not ranked for some reason in alternate history, which I found fascinating because it is an alternate history book. Uh, and the more I thought about that, the more I wondered how much it had to do, first of all, with the narrative itself, but also the fact that, you know, such a the, the brilliant writer of it is a woman. And I'm wondering if you had thoughts on that. Um, well, first of all, I have to say thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. This is such a joy to, to get to have this conversation with you. And I, um, you know, I'm such an admirer of your writing. And, and um, yeah, I've just been looking forward to this, as as you said, <laughs> we've had months to look forward to it. Um, and, and I haven't been doing much else. And I've, I've been extra excited. <laughs> um, and thank you also, of course, um, you know, to the Aspen Institute and Aspen Words and Adrian and Carolyn. Um, yeah, thank you. This is this is lovely. Um, this is such a this I it's funny because I, I think um, early on, someone said to me, I, they said, like when my book came out, which was, I, I, now I almost don't remember, I think it was May, but, um, and I said, well, I think I'm doing five events or something. And I, I and the person said, that's, that's good. Don't, don't do more than that. And then of course I ended up, I don't know how many I did, but, but this is like a really, it's my final event of 2020. And it's, I feel like it's a great one and very, very exciting. Um, so to answer your question, I mean, it, it's the it's such an interesting, strange experience to have a book published. And I think f from the first time I had a novel come out, which is now going back to um, 2005, it was this sort of um, lesson in how much I don't control. So like I basically control the sentences and then, and I have a wonderful relationship with my publisher. I've actually been with Random House since um, 2005. Um, and, but so, you know, it's like they don't, they would never, I think, want to have a cover, a book cover that I hated. Like they're, you know, they're very respectful and it's a conversation, but it doesn't always happen that my covers look like what I would have chosen or if I had single-handedly picked them, which is probably for the best that I don't. But, and so th that the sort of genres of like, you know, women's domestic fiction in my opinion is just like a, a ludicrous, or like the fact that it's like women's friendship is prepos it's preposterous that that category exists. Um, and yeah, I mean, there, I think they're, they're often, yeah, there's, <laughs> this could be a whole conversation unto itself, but I, I think that those conversations tend to, I mean, those, those categories tend to be marketing categories and not writing categories. Because, you know, I, I, I do like alternate history. By the way, this is by far the best alternate history novel I've, I've read. Oh, I just want to be clear oh. about that. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. You. Like, I've... I, I love alternate history. I, you know, my favorite to date before your book had been Stephen King's 112263, um, which is really good. This is just, it's interesting the way that it centers interpersonal relationships uh, in the context of broader history rather than history being like the main character, right? Mm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, it would not surprise me if somewhere out there um, there is a man who would write that way. And yet it doesn't surprise me at all that a, a woman would write that way so brilliantly from both perspectives in tandem. Um, you know, like as, as Adrian said, you write about the, the inflection point of Bill Clinton proposing to Hillary 
and she says no. And so they go their separate ways and it follows their careers over uh, the next, I wanna say 50 years, right? I think I'm 40, 50, I know, I don't, I can't, who knows, what, what is time, what is time? And, you know, when I first saw the announcement for your book, I think it was, I want to say early 2019 or somewhere mm. thereabouts, I was instantly just, I, 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 I think I squealed actually when I saw the announcement. I think a coworker <laughs> asked me why I was so excited and I told her and she's like, I don't get it. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, this is a great writer. She's about to, you know, um, but it's really not, you know, people might read the synopsis and think, oh, this is going to be a Bill Clinton bashing book somehow. And it's not, it's really, it's, so, it's, it's about so much, uh, so many themes that are packed in here. What would you say is the theme that you most wanted to communicate within the book to readers? Um, well, so it's funny when you, when you talk about how it's sort of, you know, about relationships, I think that's very true. And I think for me, that was always the book that I was gonna write because I, I knew that in real life, um, Bill Clinton had proposed twice and Hillary had said no and then she had said yes the third time like this is a story that they both you know sort of tell it's in, in their own mythology I mean it happens to be true but in in the Clinton mythology um, and so it felt like oh things could have been a little bit different and I think I was one of many people who after November 2016 was was thinking of oh if only you know one of 18 different things had been a little different you know the the election might have turned out completely differently so so because the you know declining the marriage proposal was was baked into my kind of conception of the book it was always going to be kind of relationship based and it's been very interesting to see varied reactions to the book where, um, in, a, in a way this was very flattering, but on Vox, you know, a, like a, political writers had this conversation where they talked about essentially like you could have written a novel that was all about if Bill and Hillary hadn't gotten married, like how would the Supreme Court be completely different? And it's like, you definitely could write that novel and yeah. it would be interesting and I might want to read it, but that's never what this was. Like, I, I think that just for me as a reader, emotions and relationships and, you know, like inner turmoil is, it's like what I turn to fiction for as a reader and as a writer. Well, it, it's interesting you say that because, you know, after election day in 2016, which breaks my heart even now to think about, yeah. you know, there were a lot of things I was thinking about like the future and I'm sure all of us were worried about what comes next in terms of policy and you know, vulnerable communities and whatnot. But I would be lying if I said that something that hadn't dominated my thinking after her concession speech the morning after uh, was just this incredible palpable anger at all the shit she had gone through to get to this point. And then to be usurped in the way she was. Um, I mean, because she, you, you know, in real life, Hillary Clinton goes back to Arkansas, she marries Bill. Uh, she goes through this whole period in which she has to flatten her personality, uh, appear to be the dutiful wife. Uh, she's forced to take his name um, as, as part of her legal name. Uh, she stops wearing glasses. Uh, I mean, just all these things that, you know, just, just, it, you understand the politics of it. And yet to watch her you know, watch her go through this at every point of her career, because it wasn't just early in his career. It was when he ran for president. It was after he became for president. It was after he, after she went into the Senate and she literally felt like she had to get, you know, coffee for fellow male senators as a way to ingratiate herself. All that goddamn shit she went through to get to that point. And then you wake up the morning after the election and she's having to be the bigger person and it pissed me off beyond belief. And so reading your book was, I would say, it gave me a level of catharsis that I think I hadn't been able to access yet. Um, what, what kind of research did you, know, you put into this? Because there's so many anecdotes that are sprinkled throughout and I couldn't tell at some point whether they were taken from real life or they were uh, maybe a, a, an amalgamation of different things you had read. Yeah, well, I think I think a lot of both. I mean, one, I, I have to say, if if I think that you're not alone in saying 
that you felt like reading the book was cathartic, but it's, it's interesting because I think there's almost like a barrier to entry where I think some of the people who would most actually enjoy the book um, are almost afraid to read it because they have such painful feelings, which I can totally understand about the 2016 election. And I almost feel like, like some people have said, I mean, many, many people have said, I ended it in tears, but good tears, or people are like, it should be sold with, you know, bottles of wine or something. Um, so I do, I mean, I think, I think in some ways I, I did write it for people who felt like they were grieving after November, 2016. And I feel like I was one of those, I mean, there were a lot of us. It's, it's so interesting because it almost feels to me like when we talk about Hillary Clinton, um, like the people who admire her and people who are critical of her are almost literally not talking about the same person. Like we see her so differently, but there's more kind of, in my opinion, there's more acknowledgement or more deference given to the people who have this very critical view. And so I feel like in some instances, the book has been um, described as like pantsuit nation fan fiction. And I think it's supposed to be an insult. And I'm like, thank you. You know, like <laughs> that's that was, <laughs> like, what, what could be higher praise? Um, in terms of doing research, um, I, I mean, I think basically the, the book, you know, has three sections where it opens in the 1970s when they're at Yale Law School, they meet and fall in love. And insofar as there's a public record, it, it pretty much follows the public record, you know, like, like their first date, which again, they've both talked about and they've both written about in their memoirs um, and her following him back to Arkansas. And then the, the marriage proposal around 1974, 75 is, is where there's a split. And so, and then it jumps to the nineties and then it jumps to 2015. And so, but I still wanted there to be a kind of relationship between, you know, fiction and what really happened. Like I, I felt like I couldn't um, or didn't want to totally leave the real world behind or Hillary's real world, which by the way, I always feel like, I'm curious if you have an opinion of this. When I say Hillary, I feel like I have to for clarity because I, if I say Clinton, it's like, am I talking about, but, but I've, I've never yeah. met her. And I, I don't think at this point I probably will. So, so do, do you refer to her as Hillary or do you feel like it's like, do you feel like we, sh we shouldn't? Oh gosh, that's such a good question. That's a great question. Um... I mean, I do I, just for clarity, but right for you, for you, it's important because that clarity, because you have the two, the two, you know, well, you have the central character, but then builds the peripheral that kind of guides a lot of the book. Which yeah, um, he doesn't disappear in the in the book. He he keeps popping up in in the nineties yeah. and the you know the two thousands. He keeps popping back up. For me, I you know I've always admired her. I've always looked up to her. Like even as a kid, I remember looking up to her, and I remember that being weird because I was lived in Central Texas at the time. And it was kind of weird for, you know, a closet trans girl presented as a boy at the time to look at Hillary Clinton. Um, but, you know, it's interesting as I've gotten older, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to come across the wrong way here, but I do feel like a lot of us just relate to her on some level. And it feels more personal. And with other politicians I admire, like, let's say Julian Castro or you know, maybe maybe someone like um, Beto O'Rourke in Texas. I don't I don't really refer to them by their first name, but with her, it just seems like there's a shared experience there that it, it's 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 more pressing. It's more immediate, I think, to our own experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait, by the way, I think I'm older than than you are. So I'm I'm 45 now, and I was um, a senior in high school when Bill Clinton was elected. So it's also the Clintons have been this fixture of American politics or or also pop culture my entire adult life. Are you, I don't, is it rude for me to, <laughs> I know you're no, younger than no, I, No, 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 I'm, I'm 34. Um, okay, so what's your first memory of, of Hillary? Like, when did you become kind of conscious of her? Uh, I think it was 96. That was my first, okay. like, presidential election that I was cognizant of. I was nine years old. And I don't know, I think, you know, I knew I wanted you know, not to make this about me at all, but, you know, I knew I, I wanted to be a woman and I knew I wanted to be a woman like her, you know, this, this attorney who just 
is, is able to do so much good in the world. And there was something about the way she moved through spaces and on news that made me admire her a great deal. And I'm like you in, in, that, in that sense, like my entire life has been, you know, Clinton centered, I would say. I think that's even, you know, even people who don't like her, they would have to admit that the Clintons really have been at the center of our political discourse for our entire lives. Oh yeah, well, and so and that's, I think another thing that kind of motivated me to write the book is so, so I, one, I think I felt similar to you. Like I remember reading about her, um, you know, when, when Bill was running in 92. And so and I was then I think a junior in high school and, and just in feeling like, oh, you know, this man who is running for president and he has this strong successful wife and like that's really cool and that's something i've never seen before and um but one of the things then you know jumping forward many decades is uh i i realized prior to and kind of during the 2016 election that many children who knew Hillary was running for president literally didn't know Bill Clinton existed, you know, let alone that there was all this cultural baggage attached to him. And so after the election, I found myself wondering, you know, what if what if adults didn't also see them as sort of a package deal or intertwined or, or saw her as her, completely her own person? And I think that was a huge motivation or inspiration for writing the book? It's very strange for folks our age, and particularly women our age, because we are caught between, I would say, two generations that in their own ways lean more toward the anti-Clinton view of the world. Mm. Um, you know, if you're, if you're more, um, if you're more boomer-esque or older, uh, you might have been thrown by her uh, progressive feminist values uh, on the main stage, right? Which, which were not radical at all. She was just basically asking for respect. And yet for folks who are much younger than us, like in their early 20s, it's fascinating to talk to a lot of young women at that age because they don't share the same feelings. Like they didn't see her go through all the shit she went through in the 90s. And they didn't have that sense of solidarity with her. I feel like we are in this particular time frame in which we kind of have seen her, her evolution in public life. And there is that sense of solidarity, even, even if we may disagree with her on times, we still want her to succeed to some extent, you know? I think in my experience, I think women who are like my age or older tend to, I mean, obviously there's a big, a big sort of, you know, conservative <laughs> liberal divide, but yeah. tend to admire her. And I think a lot of women feel like, you know, they've experienced versions of what she's experienced professionally of maybe being qualified or overqualified, you know, compared to a man who then gets the position. But I will say, I think that I underestimated the level of criticism that's kind of currently directed toward her exactly as you say, from women in their 20s. And, and something that I'm really curious about is as they, get older and maybe face po per political challenges or professional challenges, will that change or will the world change? I mean, I don't, who, who knows what, what will happen, but it is an interesting phenomenon that, that I think I was very well acquainted with kind of conservative criticism of her and, and maybe even underestimated um, more progressive, you know, youthful criticism of her. I wanna get back to your book, but I do wanna point this out real quick because you brought up a great point. I feel like the goalposts started with Hillary and they keep getting moved. So in 2016, when it was clear she was on her way to the nomination, the criticism was, I, I, I'm fine with a woman as president, I just don't want her. I want Elizabeth Warren to run. <laughs> and in the run up to 2020, it became, you know, I want a woman to run, but I don't want Elizabeth Warren. I, I, I feel like there's another woman out there who could be better. And this year, AOC is now under the spotlight. And wouldn't you know it, the new criticism is, I, I'm fine with a woman um, leading the party. I just don't want someone like AOC. So it, it feels like there is this um, turnstile um, sense of sexism with each succeeding generation that really was never about the person, but more about them being a woman. Um, I do want to pivot back to what to, to your book, though, because, I God, y'all, y'all, by the way, y'all have got to buy this book if you haven't. It, trust me, you will fly through it and you might read it again 
just to pick out all the great little like nooks and crannies. What was it like to write from her perspective, to get inside her head as this highly accomplished, uh, you know, woman who really didn't burst onto the national stage in your book till much, much later in, in, in the yeah. timeline of your book? Um, it's funny because I think the the short answer to that is that it was kind of good for my self-esteem to, to write in the first person <laughs> from the perspective of someone so like powerful and successful. And, um, you know, it, so one thing I did was, I think this is not too much of a spoiler. She becomes a law professor. I mean, as she did, she was briefly a law professor in Arkansas. And um, in my version, she becomes, you know, she, she leaves Arkansas, goes elsewhere, becomes a law professor. And I have two good friends. One friend is almost exactly Hillary's age. One friend is 50. And they're both law professors <clears throat> at Washington University in St. Louis. And I asked them a million questions. Like I, like it, it was, it ranged from, um, you know, like when you, if you go into to class on the first day of the semester, you know, like what are the first words that come out of your mouth? And then there were more, like there's a sort of legal aid plot line. And my friend Rebecca had to tell me, like she was like, Curtis, um, you, you're trying to have Hillary in housing court, but you have her in criminal court in terms of like the other cases that you refer to. So it was like, um, but it was, it was interesting because to me, my friends, Rebecca and Susan are like, you know, they're these very, even though she's, she, my fictional Hillary is not prominent, nationally until she runs for office but even as a kind of trailblazing law professor she was this you know powerful impressive person and and um and then you know she ends up giving speech or being able to like casually refer to foreign policy and i i mean i would like to be someone who <laughs> casually refers to foreign policy i never am I mean, i'm like interested in it but it's not you know, the, the words that come out of my mouth would be sort of halting if I, um, so it was, it was like, well, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. I did sometimes feel like I was sitting down to write and like putting on a blonde wig and a, and a pantsuit and, and trying to channel Hillary. And I had a sort of breakthrough. Um, there was a podcast. I'm curious because I, someone on Twitter, um, it's one time said to me, I think like Curtis and I are the only people who ever listen to this podcast. So there's a podcast called With Her that was, it's totally a tool of her 2016 campaign. There's no pretense otherwise, but she's interviewed in the most relaxed way I've ever heard in any interview. And, it, and it's weird. It actually it makes you realize like in the first few minutes, it's almost disorienting because it makes you realize how sort of like skeptical or cynical the tone is of a lot of interviews. And of course, if someone, you know, is kind of like interviewing me in a kind of, you know, vaguely mocking or skeptical way, I think I, I don't respond very well either. I don't necessarily, you know, I, I'm sort of defensive. So, so that in terms of literally hearing her voice and thinking about her syntax and her speech patterns, that podcast was really useful to me. Like she's interviewed and, um, Bill is interviewed and some senior staffers, including, um, is it Mina Harris, who's Kamala Harris's sister? Yeah. So like, I felt like I had had this niece, little like- Niece, Oh, or that I think it's, I think it's her, wait, what's, oh, is it, wait, Ma, Maya and Mina, I can't, I'm going to- Ma, Maya Harris's Mina. sister, Mina's the niece. Okay, so it's her, her sister is interviewed about their childhood in this really charm. I mean, it's sort of like a peripheral thing, but but it was a little glimpse into Kamala Harris. So, by the way, when you were saying like, and then people say, oh, she's not the right person. To me, I'm like, they're all the right person. Like, I'm like, I love Elizabeth Warren. I, I mean, <laughs> even I, I live in Minnesota. So Amy Klobuchar is my my senator. Like I, I have a lot of respect for, you know, I think she's like, she's tough in a way that I like. Um, AOC is so impressive, but anyway. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the um, one of the narrative pieces of the book is that she's constantly reflecting on how she comes across to people and wondering what it is about her that either, you know, and, and at the time detracts them and at times maybe doesn't attract them so well. Uh, and, you know, you get this sense, like she, she has such good faith in her heart when she approaches people and she has no qualms about being the smartest person in the room if she happens to be. Like she, she doesn't really, you know, diminish herself. Um, and this, it's interesting how this fleshes out with, 
you know, early love interests, including a boy in school, uh, who, you know, breaks her heart, essentially, when he tells her that, you know, I haven't really thought of you as a girl, so to speak, um, or as a love interest, because she thought that he, he, was, into, he was into her. Um, it progresses through, uh, you know, the way she interacts with different colleagues. Um, and then, of course, her, you know, the, the middle of the book where there's a love interest with uh, another professor at the law school, which I won't go too much into for spoilers, but it's just fascinating to me where she realizes along the way that there are strengths that she clearly has and there are strengths that she's clearly missing, right? at least in her own mind. Um, did you, you write this so well, and I wish I, I wish we had five hours to talk about this, but you, you have this moment where this professor she's talking to leaves a picture that they had been talking about in her mailbox at the law school. And she realizes immediately that, oh, oh, he's interested in me. Cause, cause this is back when you had the Xerox or microfilm print a picture. You couldn't just print it off your home computer or whatever. So he had to go through all the trouble to do this. And she realizes this. And so she brings it to his office or something and they're talking and it's clear, like he's a little bashful and embarrassed by it because he realizes immediately that, oh, I, that came across in a way that I was intending, even though the way it comes across is actually true that I am interested in her. And it's weird just seeing these two very brilliant, empathetic people who may not have the greatest social skills in the world, the most refined, I would say, like Bill Clinton, um, semi-sociopathic-esque kind of ways of talking to people. It's weird to watch them and sweet and very sweet to watch them realize that in real time. So I guess what I'm asking is you are clearly someone who knows people. You know how to talk to people because your dialogue throughout all your books is exquisite. What is it like to put yourself in a person's shoes who is told, you know, quite unjustifiably, to be frankly, that she's unlikable? Well, it's interesting. First of all, I'm glad you you like that little scene of that. Like no no one has ever brought up the the xeroxing scene, which I, I have a soft spot for that myself. Um, I mean, one, it's it's funny. Thank you for for liking my dialogue. Of course, I have in in a book, unlike in real life, I have the opportunity to like revise the dialogue, you know, 17 times or something. So so like I, there are times literally in life when I'll think. You know, like I'm talking to someone or I'm hearing myself and I'm thinking, oh, the thing that that person should have said <laughs> is this or the thing I should have said, like, it's almost like, and I have to remind myself, like, Curtis, that's like a privilege for when you're writing, you get to make up what other people say, but you actually don't get to do it in real life. Um, but there is, so I, I think that, I mean, it's, I, I feel actually that almost all of us, like almost every person and every adult, like, you know, some of us have very polished exteriors, but I feel like everyone is this blend of like confident and insecure and, you know, like vulnerable and confused. And it's, it's been sort of interesting to me actually getting older because I think, um, like, I think I, there's, I remain as confused about human nature as I was when I was younger, like kind of in different ways, but like by as baffled by sometimes by choices other people make, sometimes by choices that I make. And so I feel, I mean, like, like I almost always have compassion for my characters, including in this book, including Bill Clinton, and certainly including yeah. the Hillary character. And I think that, um, one thing that's sort of interesting that I, I think that you're kind of alluding to is it's it's a very strange thing where somebody somebody is their authentic self and then it, it, once you become a public person you almost have to perform yourself and I, I think that yeah. Hillary I mean again this is a subjective assessment and to me she's like this you know recognizable like smart prepared respectful person but I almost think she's not as by some people's definitions, she's not as skilled at performing herself. She's actually very good at being herself. And she, and it's, and that kind of like, like whatever your you, people can do that's potentially 
being a more fake person she's not quite as like like even i i don't know if you watch the hulu documentary but there's a few oh, yeah. which she was she was like the i think executive producer and, and there's a few scenes where she's interacting with voters and the, the and people are like kind of quasi protesting and and i feel like if i were her i mean i don't I, I, like i guess we've already broken the swearing seal i'd be like fuck you <laughs> like i feel like people are being really rude and she, and she certainly doesn't say that but you can almost see in her expression in her body language i think she is not great at suffering fools like you know kind of one on one and to me that's that's actually kind of endearing and would make me want to be friends with her but i think i think that makes a lot of voters feel resentful and and feel like she thinks she's you know superior or whatever so I, f I feel like I've like totally lost <laughs> track no, of this, no, no, the no. start of this question. Human nature. <laughs> no, I, I, I love it because you have this great subplot, not subplot. I, I would say you have this great um, sequence of scenes in the book where she's a professor at, was it UChicago? I forget. Uh, Northwestern, um, Northwestern. Northwestern, okay, it was Northwestern. Northwestern's been in the looms a lot uh, this week. Um, she's, a, she's a law professor at Northwestern and she has this student in her class that is like the classic frat boy and you know he takes her family law course and he's like well what is all what is with all these you know feminist readings what's up with this and he's just enormously disrespectful and I'm reading this and I'm like seething like I just want her to just tell him off and she doesn't she just calmly explains how it's going down and she leaves the the classroom uh and she runs into her male colleague who she relates to this just kind of offhandedly and he gets pissed off and he wants her to do something um, or wants to do something on her behalf. And she just kind of takes it in stride. And I wondered, I wondered reading that, I guess the evolution of, of what it means to have a thick skin for someone mm. like Hillary Clinton, because you can, you, can, you can imagine that earlier in her career, her thick skin was resilient. And then by the time she gets to 2016, I would be like, fuck you too, because yeah. you've been a first lady for eight years uh, you know, you, you, uh, a, a senator for eight years, then a secretary of state, and now you're the Democratic nominee for president. And there are people who are just treating you like you are, I guess, the wife of a politician who got more than she was due. Mm. And oh, uh, definitely just, some people think of her that way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it just yeah. It pisses me off so much. Yeah. And, yeah. but she, she does a really great job, I think, of, of dealing with that. And I'm wondering, you know, when you're writing the book, how did you how did you think to write those scenes where she does encounter direct sexism? Well, it's funny because I, this is a sort of sideways way of answering this, but I did think to myself, you know, when it wasn't clear who the Democratic nominee would be <clears throat> in 2020, I I thought to myself, I think that any you know woman who's sort of one of the last candidates standing, whether it was you know Warren or Harris or or Klobuchar. Um, I thought, like, I have a feeling they actually would be excellent at debating Trump or just running against Trump because there is nothing a woman hasn't seen. And I think this is probably particularly true of Kamala Harris as a woman of color. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like by the time you are elected senator, it's hard to imagine what hasn't been leveled at you and and you've kind of come out the other side and so I do I mean there's there's a quote that Hillary um herself references I think it's like in her biography um or her autobiography Living History where she talks about um Eleanor Roosevelt said you have to have something like like a hide as tough as a rhinoceros skin or something but there's there's literally I don't think there's I'd be interested if this is true for men, but there, I don't think there's any woman who has attained any degree of like fame or recognition where you couldn't log on to the internet and find scathing criticism of her. And, and even I, you know, like I'm not a household name or whatever, but it would not be hard to find you know, <laughs> scathing criticism of, of me, my books, whatever, like, uh, and, and so I, I think, I think, right. I mean, I, and so I, it's, and I think that there is a difference. Like, I think um, people who haven't had that criticism leveled at them, like from strangers, 
you know, almost are shocked to read. I mean, maybe maybe in our trollish times, it's it's less shocking or more universal. But but I think that that you know, if you are a professionally ambitious woman, which I think both of us are, you know, you that you have to kind of make peace with that, or just you know feel like okay, this says more about you than about me, you know, but, and I think, I think this is true for Hillary and, and me, which again, I'm, I feel, I'm like painting this, you know, like, well, <laughs> Hillary and I, when, when, we, when we have tea together and my fantasies, when, when Hillary and I are talking, talking about, you know, the challenges of being a working woman. Um, but I, I think that, that, you know, you can be pretty tough and you can think, oh yeah, of, of course I get criticized a lot. And she herself has said this, but there are times when even the, even though you're thick skin, like something kind of breaks through and you think like, my God, I'm, I'm also a human being, you know, like it's that, that I don't, I don't think anyone is totally impervious. You can you can be impervious to 99% of criticism and still think like, ouch, you know? Yeah, it's weird. I'll, I'll have friends who send me tweets to retweet and uh, they'll come back to me a couple days later and be like, oh my God, some of the replies I got were horrible. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's a Tuesday. That's yeah. a Tuesday yeah. for, for yeah. us. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I have a thousand more questions, but I really don't have much time before we need to get to Q&A. So I'll ask you one more. The middle of the book, uh, the biggest plot line is about Clarence Thomas and his confirmation process and the fallout from that. And you know, in, in our in, in both the real timeline and in the book, it leads to 1992 being uh, the year of the woman, in which there was a dramatic increase of women in the House and the Senate and in state legislatures who were pissed off by the way Anita Hill was treated during the confirmation process. You have Hillary Clinton exploring a possible bid for the Senate, and she's getting all her ducks lined up. She had to be convinced, by the way, in the book, which, which I think was accurate, quite accurate. Um, and she's about to pull the trigger on you know, formally launching the campaign. And then Carol Mosley Braun, uh, as, in, as in the real timeline, declares, and Hillary says, you know what? It's, it's, her, it's her moment, so I'm gonna step back. But I was so struck by that because I really thought when you first started, you know, I'm reading the book and I know where the real timeline is going because I'm a political nerd, but I'm excited because I'm like, oh, cool, this is, this is her entry point. And then you don't make it her entry point. You have her wait and you have her cede the spotlight to someone who she felt was more deserving uh, and more capable of running for office. Uh, and a, a black woman, Carol Mosley Braun was the first black woman to serve in the US Senate. What, uh, what made you have that kind of construction from the middle of the book? I was very fascinated and moved by it. Well, but, but then, okay, I, and I don't know how, if this is too much of a spoiler. So she kind of, Hillary goes through a few waves of she thinks she's going to go for it then, then she pulls back then she basically does go for it yeah and I I feel like um and it's it's been I've gotten interesting feedback for that plot line so I mean I don't want to put any spoilers I'm sorry I know no 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 I know it's 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 actually very challenging to talk about this but like I think at some point you have to throw up your hands and just yeah. give a few spoilers but um I mean so I I do um like I, I feel like with that plot line, um, I was, you know, sort of exploring, there is obviously a, a long and often very ugly history of white feminists, essentially like failing black feminists. Um, and, and there is also, you know, like, strangely, we, we sometimes pretend that you know, like Republican, well, I don't, maybe no one does <laughs> pretend this, or maybe, maybe younger generations don't pretend this, but I feel like people of my generation sort of pretended, you know, if you're a Republican, you don't necessarily care about racial justice, but if you're a Democrat, you do care about racial justice, but there's actually, you know, many policies, um, including from the Clinton administration that, that, you know, felt punitive to people of color, or disproportionately punitive to people of color. Um, and so, I think I also wanted to explore um, some of the ways that, yeah, I mean, like, like there can be misjudgments or mistakes on the part of progressive politicians that, and, and sort of then we think like, what do we who support them 
subsequently do with that or you know like like it's it's also i mean this is this kind of plays out with with joe biden where sometimes you know there's there's things about him that are very endearing and then there's parts of his record and he was a politician for a really long time where i think which i think some liberals feel like that you know i wish i wish we could skate over that but i i will say i think that um you know one of the things that was sort of interesting for me about writing the book is people have familiarity with Hillary Clinton. Like if I write a novel and I invent the character, then I'm just, it's kind of like I'm guiding the reader. But if it's the story of, of Hillary, and especially the more someone's a political junkie, the more they can say, this is what really happened in the you know 1992 Senate race. And so there is a point where my fictional Hillary says, it, it sort of agrees with another white woman who says, Carol Mosley Braun is not electable. And I think for me, some of the, the you know, dark power of that scene is supposed to hinge on the reader's familiarity with the fact that Carol Mosley Braun obviously was electable because she was elected. I, I certainly, I, th I think that there, there, and again, I've gotten all different kinds of feedback. I think there are some people who think, wait, like you're erasing Carol Mosley Braun from the record because that's, that's actually an unreasonable assumption to think that everyone knows that she was in fact the first um, black female senator. And I, I think that I should, and I do like listen to that and kind of, you know, sort of sit with that feedback or, or take it to heart. I, gosh, I have about a, a thousand more questions for you. We got to get to the Q and A portion. Curtis, I just want to thank you so much for having this one on one and inviting me to be part of it. Cause you know, I'm a huge fan of yours folks. You need to buy her books. If you don't, <laughs> If you haven't read them or have all of them, make sure that you get them. I promise you will not be sorry. You might even send me an email thanking me for telling you to buy them because they're that good. Rodham sold everywhere books are sold, including at bookshop.org where you can support independent bookstores. I'm gonna turn this over now to Carolyn of Aspen Words who's gonna lead our Q&A. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you, Curtis. This conversation went in so many directions that I never would have expected. This is kind of a great discussion. Um, and we do have lots of audience questions, so I'll jump right in. Um, this first one is from Rachel, though several others asked variations on it. Um, so I'm curious what permissions, if any, you had or wanted to get before publishing. And has Hillary Rodham Clinton responded to the novel? If not, how do you think she would react to the book? So first part on permissions and then has Hillary responded and how would she react? So um, uh, I did not seek out Hillary's blessing. Um, and I, you know, the publisher, uh, Random House, my actually my my US publisher and my UK publisher, um, you know, had lawyers vet the, the book and people do sometimes ask me about that. And I, I almost feel like a person who's a lawyer, which I'm not, is sort of better at addressing some of the nuances of um, what is and isn't permissible. But, um, you know, if you if you read the book, it was vetted by lawyers. So um, that's that's one thing. Um, I mean, in terms of so, uh, it, it, I think it is probably the number one question I get is, has Hillary read it? So I have again, as I mentioned to Charlotte, I've never met Hillary. I've never had contact with her. I know a few people who who know her or who have worked with her, um, and I have never received any indication that she has read it. And I don't think. I think if I were her, I, I wouldn't, which pe people think like, oh my, you know, you, you did all <laughs> this research and it's all about her and how can she not? But the sort of, you know, like I, I feel like in the context of her life where um, as the novel actually refers to, there are like nutcrackers in her image or, you know, she's been portrayed by Kate McKinnon and Amy Poehler on Saturday Night Live or, you know, there are like coloring books featuring her. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nonfiction books that I, I do think that she must have, again, I feel like Charlotte and I were sort of talking about the thick skin. She must have developed techniques for tuning out attention that doesn't feel productive or or relevant and as much, as much as it pains me to say this about the the book that is my baby i can see that's not feeling productive from her perspective and i, I the the sort of 
I, I thought when it came out, I did think like, should I send it to her? Because I felt like at, at the least, if she's at all interested, she shouldn't have to pay for it. And then like, and I was like, I could flag a few pages that like, maybe she wouldn't like all of it, but she might like these. Um, and then, but it just partly because of the shutdown, you know, her address is publicly findable, but I just felt like it's a little weird to write a book about her. It's called Rodham. It has her image and then to send it to her house. And I kind of felt like, okay, Curtis, like leave her alone. <laughs> but you know, if, if she ever, I mean, I would be, if, if I received word that she was interested in reading it, I would be happy to select like, you know, the, the most, uh, you know, enjoyable <laughs> sections. Can I just say, I think she'd love it. I really do. I think really? she'd, I think she'd, I think she'd love the book. I do. I did. That's my hunch, but you know, maybe I could be wrong. So. <laughs> I mean, she is a reader. I know she is definitely, and including a reader of fiction. But. Yeah. Well, you'll have to let us know if, if she does eventually and, and how she reacts to it. Um, so this next one's from Karen and it's what differences did you feel in reimagining history for Rodham versus American wife? And just so everyone knows American Wife is based on Laura Bush's life um, and um, early novel of Curtis's, so. Which came out, it's funny, it came out in um, 2008. And so, so a, a big difference between the books is um, American Wife, you know, uses fictional names. So the main character who is loosely based on Laura Bush <clears throat> is called Alice Blackwell. And I actually made the decision to not, I thought about changing names in Rodham or I even thought of, you know, like maybe they're called H and B or something like that. But I, the reason I didn't change their names is that I felt like it was a, it was kind of a, like a scientific experiment where you only change one variable at a time. And if I made them into like Helen and Bob and they meet at, you know, Yale Law School and then they go their separate ways someone would there, you know, she follows him back to Arkansas, but they don't get married. Like someone might think this seemed like it was based on the Clintons, but then it, you know, deviated from the Clinton story. And mm -hmm. so it, I just thought it would be like distracting. I, I may have underestimated that it's distracting in a different way to read, you know, <laughs> they're called Hillary and Bill, you see them, you know, lying in bed together. So, so I guess it depends on, on how you define distracting, but um, it, so this did, I mean, again, as Charlotte said in the beginning, this is very much an alternate history. Whereas I think that was, American Wife was more a fictionalized version of more or less the historical timeline or like a very embellished, imagined, you know, like these are the scenes that we know happened or, you know, George W. Bush quit drinking at some point and none of us were there, but I've imagined what the dialogue might have been. Um, whereas this was kind of creating a life and, and trying to think sort of literally, but then also sort of entertainingly, like what would life have been like and what would American history have been like if Hillary didn't marry Bill? Yeah. Um, this next one is anonymous and it's actually for Charlotte. Has this book inspired you to run for office and to follow up for Curtis? Has that been a response from many female readers to the book? Are you running for office, Charlotte? Oh, goodness. Uh, Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've thought about it, but you know, I think that when you run for office, you're, you're literally making a case that you're the best person for the job. And I have not found an opportunity where I felt that. Uh, I, I would rather dedicate myself right now to supporting other great people, particularly women and, and folks of color and queer people who are running for office. So who knows about the future, but in the meantime, I'm gonna read Curtis's books because uh, she's a fantastic writer. <laughs> Wait, you're in DC, right? You live in DC. I am. Yeah, yeah. okay. But I'm from the great state of Texas. <laughs> And Curtis, has, has that been a response from many readers, kind of that your book made them think about political life or? Um, well, it's funny, I, I have heard from a few people, like a, uh, this is a friend of a friend said, I voted for Trump in 2016 and this book makes me feel like I shouldn't have, which I was sort of like, well, it's a little wow. late for that, I know. But um, so I think it has, you know, 
made some people sort of think about their choices in that regard. I, I will say writing, you know, this is again, another sort of non-spoiler spoiler, like Hillary enters politics in this, in this story. And I did feel like, you know, I, I have always been interested in political personalities and whatever, but it did, when you write something and, and, you know, I think similar to when you teach something, you have to sort of take responsibility for the facts in a particular way. Like you have to be able to explain it to someone else. And so I, I don't think I have the personality at all that I would ever run for office, but if I wanted to, I think I understand how it works. Almost like, okay, you have to file by a certain deadline. And like, and even <laughs> like, these are the people, you know, the first staff members that you hire before you, you know, have even announced. And then you announce this way if you have some public profile, but you announce this other way if you don't already have a public profile. And these, those were like kind of nitty gritty details that I would say I did not know before, before writing this book. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm reading Obama's new memoir and learning about a lot of those nitty, nitty gritty details too that I didn't know as much about. Um, I would be remiss not to point out real quick if that you are a woman thinking about running for office and you're reading these books and it seems too complicated, just push that aside. Just explore it. Talk to people, see what's out there. Um, there's so many resources for women who are thinking about running for office. So don't ever, don't ever feel that you're not qualified. Women tend to feel they're not qualified for office when they're absolutely qualified. Men tend to feel that they're overqualified for office when they're not qualified at all. Uh, <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Well, and, and actually to add to that, um, you know, something Charlotte, that you mentioned before, it, a character, like the character of Hillary has to be sort of encouraged to run, which is almost always true for women. And this is something I don't think I knew before writing this book. Don't you think there are almost like boot camps? Like, like if I said, I want to run for Congress or even like I want to run for, you know, state Senate or something like there are organizations that would help me figure out the next step. Like, it's not like you have to go it alone. So many, uh, Yale University has a campaign school. There's Emerge, which is a great organization, Run for Something, uh, run by Amanda Littman um, and Ross Marcello. Uh, that, that, it, it's a great organization for young people. So there, trust me, there are no shortage of resources out there for people who don't know where to start, but want to run. This is so great. We are recording this talk and we'll send it around to everyone who's listening. So if you can't remember these um, suggestions, uh, you'll be able to revisit it. I know I will. Um, so you, last- Carolyn, you, maybe you should run for office, Carolyn. Uh, <laughs> Just a thought. I, I think Aspen Words is, is um, where I'm at for now, but <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, last question here. Beyond the obvious question of your speculative novel, what would have happened if Hillary had decided not to marry Bill? Was there one central motivating question that prompted you to write this book about power, ambition, sacrifice, or something mm -hmm. else, for example? Um, I mean, I think that it really was a combination of one feeling so ups upset about the 2016 election and sort of not being able to think of about anything else, but also not wanting to live in like Trump's reality. Um, and so it was almost like, oh, the solution is I can write a novel. And then every every day I, I go to this imaginary place that's that's different. So I think there was that, there was the sort of knowing that Hillary had said no to the first two marriage proposals is such a like interesting marital origin story that, that made me think even sort of about the butterfly effect and you know are there parallel lives that all of us could have led and if we had said you know yes or no to this like dinner invitation or this job offer or you know like like in my early 20s I interviewed for a job in Dallas or um, you know, like just kind of random, like, like, and do I have a life as a Texan <laughs> that I, I just don't know about? Um, so <laughs> I think, I think it was like, I think for me, any novel, you know, and because I aspire to write like a 200 page novel, but I seem to mostly write like 400 page novels. Any novel is a combination of kind of topics and, 
you know, like, you know, juiciness. And as Charlotte was saying, like, the, the, there's definitely so much about like, human emotions and relationships that's super interesting to me and it's it's sort of like if there's a plot that ties those all together i basically find it irresistible <laughs> well that's a great a great place to end i think i want to thank you both for your time tonight for the preparation um, for being here and um, giving us so much to think about. I hope everyone will read Rodham and all of Curtis's other books. Um, uh, thank you to everyone for tuning in again. And please join us for more of these Winter Words author talks January through April. Details will be posted on the screen in just a moment. Um, stay well, everyone. Happy holidays and good night. Thank you. Thank night. you.